So welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Madsen and I lead the project office in the department. Uh, today we're having a panel session over multiple venues here and in Sydney. Uh, and uh, uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that this event is being held on the lands of the Ngunnawal people. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land and pay my respect to elders past. As many of you will know, July is Innovation Month and agencies across the service have organised a wide range of events, broadly aligned with the theme Dream, Dare, Do. These events are intended to help staff expand their horizons, tap into their creativity and to think differently. This week's events in the department fit into the Dare theme and are intended to help get people thinking in new ways or to introduce new and emerging ideas. Now I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, we have two speakers in Sydney, Matt Barry and Martin Stewart-Weeks, and one speaker here in Canberra, Lisa Router. Uh, Matt Barry is Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of Freelancer.com. Matt is an award-winning entrepreneur, technologist and lecturer, and was named the inaugural Business Review Weekly Entrepreneur of the Year in 2011. Matt is the co-author of more than 20 US patent applications. He is one of the worldwide LinkedIn influencers and frequently writes on the topics of entrepreneurship and technology. Uh, Martin Stewart Weeks is advisor, consultant and principal of Public Purpose Proprietary Limited. Martin is also the senior advisor to Deloitte's public sector practice in policy development and innovation within government. Martin has for many years been a leader in exploring the intersection of policy, government, technology and innovation. Lisa Rauter is First Assistant Secretary and Head of Innovation Exchange at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. The Innovation Exchange is aimed at opening opportunities across Australian government's aid program for new partnerships and, innovation and innovative approaches. Previously, Lisa headed uh, AusAid's Africa program, and she has a background in public-private partnerships working across the APS in many departments. So the format for today's discussion is that each panellist will provide us with a brief presentation uh, on the theme, Seeking the Courage to Innovate. And following that, we'll have time for some questions and answers. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Matt to start the presentation. Okay. Well, I'll only speak for a few minutes, but um, I thought I'd take, phrase the, the concept from the perspective of Australia as a country needs to really seek the courage to innovate. I mean, we have, as we've seen in the recent budget, uh, I think a, a fairly structural problem with the, with, with the way in which we, we think about the GDP of the economy in that one line item of one commodity that we export has blown a $20 billion hole uh, in, in, in the balance of payments. And in fact, that, that commodity is iron ore, and, and the price of iron ore has continued to, continue to drop. And we're going to, as a country, we need to really be thinking about what is, what is the structure of, of the composition of GDP in the next 20 years that we that we want in terms of in terms of how we want to put it together, right? And we need to be, you know, we have we have a lot of problems here being in Australia. We have a, a very small population of, of only 23 million people. We have a workforce of about 12 million people. We are geographically very, very far away from the rest of the world. Um, and while our population is, is very well educated, um, we've had a problem in the fact that we've had uh, a decline, even though we're in the midst of one of the biggest technology and I think economic revolutions in, in the history of mankind, we've had a monotonic in, a decline in enrolments in people entering into the field of technology. And the reason why I think technology is so important is that you know, our economy as it is today is fairly primitive. It's about 69% services, and, and the rest of it is um, really mining and not mining related services. So there's about 8% which comes from mining, or things that we dig up from the ground um, that we don't even really elaborately transform into manufactured products anymore. About 5% comes from dead fossils, <laughs> effect effectively things that have died, gone into the ground that we get you know, petro, uh, you know, long chain hydrocarbons from and, 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 and energy sources, and 3% from things we, we grow. And that's great when the commodity super cycle is going up, but when the commodity super cycle is going down and it comes down just as hard, or if not harder, than when it goes, the rate at which it goes up. Um, and I can't really think of any other industry where a 20-year-old can start a, a business and have 11 years later have it worth 
$250 billion. And this is exactly what Mark Zuckerberg has done with Facebook. Um, today, Facebook is worth more than the combined value of BHP, the Commonwealth Bank, and Woolworths, right? Uh, and this is, this is a company started by a 20-year-old uh, 11 years ago. And we have the capability of doing that in, in Australia. I mean, we, 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 we do have a workforce that's, that is very, very highly, highly educated. And, and some of our computer scientists and, and uh, entrepreneurs that, that um, have started technology companies are some of the greatest in the world. So people like you know, Mike Cannon Brooks and Scott Farquhar over at Atlassian, um, the guys over at Campaign Monitor, uh, the world leaders in what they do, uh, Ben and Dave and so forth. In Vato, Collis and Cyan Taid uh, out of uh, Melbourne, uh, the world leaders in what they do in providing uh, stock um, uh, images and, and, and content uh, globally, the largest marketplace doing that in the world. You know, 99 Designs, um, you know, Big Commerce, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But, you know, as a, as a, as a country, while the technology industry exists and is growing and has taken a long, a long time to get going, we, we, we haven't really done a lot to really encourage it. And, you know, we live in such a, a world of opportunity today where literally, the, thanks to you know, the internet, thanks to uh, communications, uh, software, and software in the world, there is just so much opportunity that exists right now, right today, as every industry is being remapped and re reshaped as, re as a result of you know, everything heading, heading into software, heading into the cloud, and the ability for anyone in the world to kind of communicate with, with each other. And I, I think that you know, we, we really, as a country, need to, to have, a, a, have a very, very focused effort to try and build and support this industry and, and really promote it to the next level. And there's a lot of areas that we're really failing uh, to do so. Uh, but, I, but I think some of the solutions are actually quite simple. Um, you know, one solution is, one thing we need to do is we need to get more people just generally into the industry. And the way we need to do that is we need to start earlier with kids in K-12. We had a chance to do this last year with the, with the review of the national curriculum. Um, you know, countries all around the world are now teaching programming as part of, a part of um, that, um, you know, educating kids, whether it's the UK, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Estonia. Um, uh, everyone's doing it, but when we're not doing it. We had a chance to ad adopt that, but we didn't. Um, but I think that if we, if, we, if we make some simple steps to, to, I mean, every kid wants to develop, you know, the next Google Glass, the next self-driving car, work on SpaceX and send rockets to the moon, satellites, uh, build the next, next Facebook, build the next Instagram or mobile phone app. You know, we have the raw talent that has a desire to, to actually do this, but they can't really connect the dots into, into, into actually getting into, into the industry uh, today. Uh, the other problem we have is the financing climate for, for technology businesses. Um, it's, it's particularly poor. Uh, there's an easy solution for that. Um, it's a two-step solution. Um, you know, we've got great companies um, uh, out there in, that, are, that are starting up in Australia, but they mostly have to bootstrap themselves. Now, there are pros and there are cons of bootstrapping. The pros of bootstrapping are that, you know, it, it, that um, at the end of the day, you end up owning the whole company rather than have to go dilute it by, by taking in, in, in external shareholders. But it takes a lot longer to do so, right? And it's a lot harder to do so. And, and for, quite frankly, a lot of our companies don't really have the, the financial firepower to really compete at the global level. Um, the problem we have is that, that the venture capital industry is, is basically dead and will not be resurrected, I think, any, any time soon. Uh, so we've got to figure out creative ways in which to finance these companies. And I think the solution is actually very, very, very simple. And government has, has part of a role to play here. And I know that there are some steps uh, uh, moving forward here. One step is on, on the early stage of financing of businesses. We should uh, uh, put some, some uh, mechanisms in place to allow crowd financing at, at, at the low end. And I think it's a very simple way where we can get you know, the general public. Of it. You know, in Australia, we have a, a huge propensity to take on risk, uh, particularly as a financial reward. We, take, we, we bet about, on average, $7.27 per capita on the horse races at, at the Melbourne Cup, for example. And there's a, you know, we've had a very active resources industry um, that, that's been financed basically from the crowd through the Australian Securities Exchange. So I think that the early stage we can do a lot in terms of the crowdfunding uh, reform, and I think, and I think at the, the later stage we have the fourth largest equity capital market in the world, which is the Australian Securities Exchange, where increasingly, uh, which, is, which is good to see, a lot of Australian technology companies are going there rather than trying to seek money offshore or, 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 um, or battle it out uh, without the fire by themselves. Um, but I think you know there, there, there is opportunity everywhere, and uh, it doesn't matter whether you're in the, you know, the public sector, the private sector whether you're a kid at school or whether you're a university student coming fresh out of college or whether you're a seasoned academic or a professional from the industry, that there is a huge amount of opportunity out there to go and create businesses. And right now we live at a really unique time and I think in the history of the world where there are just so many industries that could be modernised in so many different ways and there are so many products or services that, that, we, you know, that, 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 are, that are actually... Um, that we could deliver to the world in a very simple manner. And, and the cost to actually start these businesses is, is dropping... Every single day, as you know, it, it gets easier and easier to to build a product, and build a service, and get it out there and get it distributed. 
And, and, and the other great thing is that that distribution is, is, is really unprecedented in the fact that there are now three, bi three billion people on the internet. So if you do have that spark of an idea that you want to you go out, get, you get out there and, and build a company around, it, you now have three billion people that can potentially buy that product or service that are available on the internet to do, to do so. You know, the first dot-com boom in 1997, there are only 50 million people on the internet. So it's getting easier and easier and easier uh, to, to do this. And, and certainly in the next, uh, by 2020, they're saying there'll be 5 billion people on the internet and there's 7.1 billion people on the planet. So that there is some way to go there. So, you know, it, it is really an amazing time. It's actually a magical time if you want to be an entrepreneur. There's just so much opportunity out there. It's just, I think us as a country need to really um, make it a strategic imperative of the nation to actually go and just facilitate the environment um, and really seek the courage um, so that you know, people in this great country can really innovate. Thank you. Thanks. So there we are. Um, that was terrific. And I guess the focus I want to take slightly different but kind of riffs off that. Uh, and I must say, it seems to me, if you want two good examples of what courageous innovation looks like, you know, one of them might be freelancer and the other one might be the innovation exchange. So we'll see what Lisa has to say in a minute. Um, but I was kind of reflecting on what I'd like to throw at the audience, if you like, in the group around why we have this notion that it takes courage to innovate. And I think it does. I think there's no question about that. Um, and in a very small way, I've had a bit of experience, but I mean, just looking and watching at the way the world is turning, um, you, can, you can sense it, it does, uh, no matter how some of the circumstances might be making it easier and more attractive, and I think um, Matt's absolutely correct about that, the fact is it's still a tough gig. Um, and why is that? So I thought I'd just reflect briefly on that. I've got three particular ideas I want to throw at people. Very much influenced by, in fact, some meetings I was involved in last week, talking to the children of distance. I've just come back literally today from London. And last week there was a very interesting meeting in London of all the, many of the, not all, a large number of the innovation labs that are now spru uh, sp uh, sprouting up all over the world, mostly in and around government. That was the focus, so Mind Lab. Um, a whole bunch of um, lo uh, laboratories and, and um, lab-type um, organisations in North America. The Centre for Social Innovation from here was over there and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm slightly influenced by what I heard there. But I, I just, I'll put the, uh, co uh, the quick context in one of the most famous, I think, quotes that ever comes out of this kind of conversation, which comes from Machiavelli, who in The Prince gave this ex example about why change was so difficult. Many people might know bits of this quote, but I thought it was worth quoting. It's, it's a little longer. It's about five lines. And he made this observation to The Prince, who's um, in Chapter 6 at The Prince. There's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. For the reformer has enemies in all those who profit by the old order, and only lukewarm defenders in all those who would profit by the new order, this lukewarmness arising partly from fear of their adversaries and partly from the incredulity of mankind who do not truly believe in anything new until they've actually had the experience of it. Um, so that's the kind of basic problem. So why it, you have to be courageous instinctively to be an innovator, an innovator seems to me, firstly, uh, firstly in... Most important is because innovation is about introducing a new order of things. And generally speaking, while we all want that, we none of us want it. We sort of, you know, we're somewhat schizophrenic about it. The second observation I would make, and it's related to that, is it, it never fails to amaze me how obviously it's true that when you do innovation, substantive innovation, you tend to subvert whatever is the existing distribution of power and control and authority, that stuff goes up in, in smoke. And generally speaking, exactly as Machiavelli warned us, those people who are currently in charge of the commanding heights of power and control and authority don't, generally speaking, tend to like that all that often, all that much. I think the third reason you have to be a bit courageous is, frankly, innovation is pretty hard to predict exactly and certainly quite hard to measure. And it's very hard to be particularly certain about where you're going to end up because, and again, Matt, I suspect, and all of those names he just reeled off a moment ago would be people who are capable of starting on a venture without knowing where the end is. This idea that, to some extent, genuine innovators make this up as they go, make this up as they go along. That doesn't literally mean that they make it up as they go along and they just sort of wake up one day and say, well, I don't have any idea what I'm going to do, but I'm just going to start something. 
mostly with a burning focus and a passion and all the rest of it, but there is this sense in which the innovation venture is a venture that has to be emergent or whatever that, all that kind of language. And that's very unsettling because, particularly in government, but it's true, as I'm now finding out, having spent 13 years working in San Francisco, uh, an organisation which prided itself on being somewhat innovative, um, and I'm now working in, in an, uh, an amongst uh, a large corporate consulting firm, you know, the private sector is just as complicated about these issues as the public sector is. Um, it's just large organisations find this stuff difficult. So if you're going to be innovative inside a large organisation or with, in a space where large organisations operate, you're going you're to have to be courageous. There's no question about that. And then I thought I should just, um, I should just also um, remind myself what courage meant. So I went to the dictionary, as you do. The state or quality of mind or spirit that enables one to face danger, fear or vicissitudes with self-possession, confidence and resolution, which is obviously a great definition of Matt Barry or Lisa Router, I suspect, and various other people. But that's kind of why you need to be courageous, because there will be an awful lot of people who either explicitly or implicitly will be trying to stop you, either by ignorance or just you know, ignoring you, or actually actively making sure you are not successful. And if we don't, you know, if we want the most obvious and most current and most burning example, this state is about to have its, its uh, review um, uh, regulatory review about Airbnb, uh, about sorry about Uber, but about the, the wider sharing economy. So Gary Sturgis is about to do the review, and that's happening in cities all over the world. And again, Matt and others will know that story only too well. And it's obviously one of the great examples of of that kind of disruptive talk about you know talk about a new order of things. So here are my three ideas that seem to me to be increasingly driving the need to be innovative and therefore the need to be courageous. So one is this idea of innovation as necessary. And by that it seems to me increasingly it's just so obvious but it's so true that innovation is becoming so basic and necessary for survival and relevance and impact. You know, if there's one thing in the public sector in particular, it seems to me, if there's one thing we're all learning very rapidly is that the real currency of public institutions is relevance. And what a lot of innovation does, what a lot of innovation does, is it creates new ways for people and organisations to be relevant that don't require them to be either subservient to or connected to the large institutions that seem to be the place to go at the moment. In other words, they give you an alternative. Um, so I think one of the things that drives us is that this is a necessary thing. You, like, you just can't not do it. The second idea, it seems to me, is this idea of innovation as a contest. And by that I mean primarily a contest between the people at what I would broadly describe as the centre, which is broadly sort of what you might call old power, but people who think they're in control, okay, head office, the Prime Minister's department, or even the Prime Minister's office, or the Premier's office, or whatever, and the edge. Because generally speaking, and again, um, we've got good examples of it in this room or in this virtual room, most innovation starts off and feeds off and, and incubates at the edge, and that's where these fires start. So it seems to me innovation is this constant contest, then, in the end, between this energy and insight and, and excitement that bubbles up, like Facebook, like Mr Zuckerberg when he was you know, in the dorm room and all the rest of it, and then this gradual sense that they want to take over the commanding heights themselves. So I think that's the other, that's the second thing. The third thing I would put on the table, which I think is particularly relevant for people inside the public sector, is, a, is this notion of what I've described as innovation as the antibody. And by that I mean innovators inside systems are often welcomed and cherished and repelled and um, stymied almost in equal measure. I spent 13 years working in a very small little innovation group within Cisco which was almost everything that the company wasn't. So we didn't charge upfront fees. We, we made no money directly for the company. This is a company that makes money like week by week, never mind month by month. And here we were swanning around, about 300 of us, having you know, interesting conversations with people. And the metric was not how much did you sell this week and how much are you going to sell next month. It was who do you know and what conversations are you having and um, do they like what you've got to say and can you tell us something about where they want to go and are we influencing and all the rest of it. Much more difficult. Completely antithetical to almost every element of the DNA of Cisco. And yet there we were sitting in the middle. And the truth was, and this is another reason why you have to be courageous a bit as an innovator, is half the time the company loved us to death and then the other half of the time they wanted to get rid of us because they thought we were a waste of money, waste of time, 
and were not able to be quickly factored into um, the way in which they understood and measured success. Like, we were completely the wrong... And yet there we were for nearly 15 years. Largely as a result of John Chambers and others holding that space and so on. So this idea that innovators are antibodies or the other, the other analogy that came quickly to me when I was thinking about that is, you know, they're the, they're the grit in the oyster that makes the pearl or whatever that analogy. You know how pearls are made. And, you know, and it goes rub, 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 and the next thing you know, bingo, there's a pearl. Exactly. So, look, examples. Um, there are thousands of them. As I say, we've got two in the room already. We've already talked about Uber. Uh, all that sharing economy stuff, Airbnb, and some great work that's being done in the UK um, by a company called FutureGov that I happen to know quite well, Dominic Campbell, who's doing some work here as well around things like patchwork, casserole. These are all sort of social. These are kind of actually experiments in what I would describe, in fact, largely off the back of Dom's uh, description as the Uberization of human services. And I think that's interesting because that ethic of, you know, simple, robust platforms that connect crowds that allow them to do a lot more for themselves and with each other is very, very powerful in many, not all, but in many settings in the human service space. So there are heaps of them. Um, I got to, I've got to know over the years recently a company called Circa, and Matt might know them, who started off as a bunch of universities doing um, basically financial markets information. I mean, this is, you know, world-beating stuff. Um, and quite unsettling for, you know, the big kind of uh, uh, settled patterns. So, you know, we've got no shortage of examples of people who are doing it, and they're all doing it, it seems to me, more or less uh, overtly unsettling the existing order and trying to introduce a new order. So three quick questions to finish with. So if you do want to innovate, do you have to be courageous? And I think to some extent the answer is, at least at a residual level, the answer is yes. So I suppose the observation I would make is if you expect this to be relatively easy, unless you're doing something else which you might call improvement or incremental change, which is nothing wrong with that. Sometimes that can be incredibly valuable. But if you're genuinely trying to change the order of things, then you are going to have to be courageous and you have to expect it to be a little bit difficult and probably quite unpleasant. Uh, and possibly somewhat under-resourced and all the rest of it. So if you don't want that kind of life, then probably this kind of innovation isn't, isn't for you. Um, if we want more courageous innovators, what do we want from our courageous leaders who make that happen? And my quick observation is, uh, and it's the only example I've got right at the moment because I'm working right in the middle of it, the Department of Family and Community Services here in New South Wales, a lot of innovation going on around, ch uh, around child protection. Um, and a number of other spaces. What I sense is people like Michael Coots Trotter and others at the head of that department are very, very good at what I would call holding the space. These are leaders who recognise that part of their value is not to do much more than to kind of carve out the space, let the innovators have a go, but hold it for them because there's a lot of pressures for that not to happen, whether it's from Treasury or the Minister or other departments, but what they do is they, they kind of push that back as long as they can. I think that's kind of important. Um, and the third question I would quickly throw in is an issue that came up interestingly in the conversations in London last week at this conference around labs, is not so much the ability to be innovative, but the ability to help bigger systems and institutions absorb the innovation, because it's often where that breaks down. Um, and there was great conversation, talk about centre and edge, whether you should have these lab type, and this is a bit of a segue, I hope, for Lisa, if, the, if she wants to take it. Do you have these lab type uh, ventures, you know, deep in the heart of the business or out on the edge? And there are good, exa there are good arguments for, for either way. But the question is, how rapidly can these great, often unsettling innovations be absorbed back into the order of things so that they then become the new way of doing business? So I'll leave it at that. Okay, excellent. Hi, Matt. Hi, Martin. Um, okay. And thanks for having the Innovation Exchange here uh, to be part of this conversation. I think all of these things, it's good to just share um, views and values. Um, and it's, I guess, to give you a bit of background on, on the Innovation Exchange, uh, and hopefully that'll address a little bit of your question, Mar uh, Martin, which is, you know, whether to have a lab or not. Um, we were established in what was purposely a very dif different physical space from the rest of the department. Um, it feels differently for those of you who might have come and, and, and visited. Um, and the team is established, again, purposely differently. So we have 
the theory is half public servants and half secondments from, from the outside, whether that be people from academia, people from the private sector, or other type of think tanks or, or social enterprises to come and work with us. And the idea behind that is that, that it expands our knowledge, expands our ways of thinking, and helps us think about things that we may never have ever visualised ourselves. Um, so we are just a unit um, within DFAT, like, like all others, um, but we've got a unique role. Um, that means we've been given $140 million to spend over four years, and to use that money to influence the $17 billion that will be spent in the A program over the same amount of time. So no easy task. Um, but I guess the reason that the Minister set us up as, as a lab to address your question, Martin, was she wanted it to be um, quite identifiably different way of working. She wanted it to be identifiable as a new approach that DFAT was going to take and she was, I guess, worried that if we embedded that too deeply within DFAT, um, there would be no visibility of the fact that DFAT was taking a different approach. Um, but that comes with its own risks. So within the first sort of few months of us being set up, um, the answer to every question in every meeting was the exchange will deal with that. Um, which was nice, um, but it also meant that, that there was massive, massive load that we really just couldn't handle in our sort of first months. So part of the designing what we would do and how we would do it was to be very conscious of making sure that everything we did, we did in partnership with the right area within DFAT, um, so that they owned something, they owned projects just as much as what we did. Um, and where we can, we also get them to pitch in money so that they have real skin in the game when we're doing something. Um, and there's some other things that we've, we've done to make sure we embed ourselves across the department as well, which I'll get to. Um, but essentially, the innovation is going to happen not just with us existing. Um, it happens through top-down leadership, um, and it happens through staff demand for change. Um, and we've sort of started on the path of, I think, addressing both. Um, so courage to innovate, I think, starts with some level of permission. And it doesn't mean specific permission for an activity or a, or a thought process. It means a culture of the decision making, the decision makers suggesting that you know, a new approach or connecting with a new partner or bringing other voices into the design process is okay. Um, or better than okay, that it's encouraged or rewarded in some way. Um, so the creation of a specific, specific unit like the Innovation Exchange with a budget allocation um, to drive innovation was, was the Minister's way of, of loudly saying, I want innovation to start happening. Um, and I want to resource it properly so that it happens. Um, but that alone was obviously not going to be enough. We're a department of 5,000 people and we're spread all over the world, so one single message was never going to cut it. Um, and so we needed the secretary, we needed the executive on board, and we needed staff to start demanding that the change happened and that there was some pathways for them. Um, so the secretary, Peter Varghese, um, while you know, he's a little tentative, DFAT's not known for its creativity and innovation, um, he he's, has been really, un, really willing and supportive for us to just try something new. You know, for us to say, Peter, we're not quite sure how this is going to work, we're really not sure how the outcome's going to be, but can we give it a try? Um, and for him to say yes takes a lot of courage on his behalf and the risks that they face him as a secretary. So that's been really useful. Um, and one of the things that we asked him, that could we, could we run an ideas challenge? Uh, and it's something that seems to be getting out across government. Um, but this was our way of, I guess, getting a, a picture of what did DFAT under staff understand about what innovation was? Um, how did they see that they, what their role in, in that process would be? And how do we get them actively involved in the innovation process? Um, so we, we went, well, actually, I'll get to the detail of that, that in, a, in a second. But um, so to go backwards a little bit, the Innovation Exchange was set up to find new ways of financing aid. It was there to act as a catalyst for new approaches for development assistance. And it was to enhance our impact or our cost efficiency on, on sustainable economies in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so the idea is that we'll try all new, new technologies uh, and approaches um, and hopefully bring a level of entrepreneurism and commercialism to the aid program, which doesn't happen now. Um, so we're a small team um, and of creative, relatively collaborative, uh, and fairly well-networked people uh, of both public servants and secondments, as I talked about, um, to drive that innovation and to try and have influence. 
Um, and we look purposely for even more creative people to work with to enhance our thinking. So two really good examples in the audience, Mark and Haley from CollabForge, really help us broaden our thinking. Um, and we're also working with people like Martin Stewart Weeks uh, and the Head of Innovation from the World Bank, Chris Vian, who are helping us just change our way of thinking. So if we sat there as a team of bureaucrats and tried to come up with the answers, we'd come up with some, but whether they're the best or, or the right ones, um, we wouldn't know. Um, but we do work differently. We work on a separate IT system to the rest of DFAT. So we have a cloud-based computing system. Um, we also have, a, we try to test out and take new procurement approaches. Um, and we look to have more results-based contracts rather than the traditional uh, contracts. We have no offices, we have no walls between our staff, um, and we work on an unclassified information basis, again, a rarity for, for DFAT. Um, but that's so that we can share as much information as we possibly can. Um, and we also brainstorm more than we brief. So because we have no walls between us, because we, we openly talk about everything that we have on, there's no need to brief anybody in the team before they go to meetings or do anything because we all know what's going on. Um, and we're in the business of expanding our knowledge and creating solutions to known problems, not in maintaining the status quo. So we're just not looking at, at small incremental difference. Um, but we will only be successful if we drive innovation across the whole department, not if we do it in isolation. Um, so we need to make sure the permission that we've been given to innovate actually translates into different decision making across the whole, the whole department. Um, so, unfortunately, last time I looked, there's no online catalogue as to how we can find the best, most creative ways to deliver aid or, or other government services. Um, so what this means is we need to get together new ideas and, and new voices and, and actually experiment to find what those best ways are. Um, so innovation really happens as an isolated idea bubble that, that blossoms into the most brilliant thing. It usually start, takes by starting a small idea, building on it, adapting it, bringing a new thought process into it, and then trialling it and adapting it and trialling it again. Um, this process of, of iterative development makes it less scary, it means less courage I think is needed. Um, and it means that this taking a different approach means not investing years and years um, in developing an idea or developing a concept before you then go and, go and implement it, um, which makes it easier to step away if it's not working or cheaper to step away. Um, we also minimise, try to minimise that upfront work. So to give you an example, to design an aid program traditionally takes between 18 months and two years' time. And in that time, we've invested a lot of resource time and a lot of, a lot of financial um, budget in, in order to do that. And so by the time you get to the process of actually implementing, it's a pretty scary thing to go, this is not quite working the way we want, we want to step away because you've invested so much. Whereas if you trial something on a smaller scale, you've invested less and it's easier to step away or adapt it or change it if it's not quite working. Um, so knowing when to exit something is, is as much a process of what we want to learn as knowing when, how to make something a success and, and, and scale it up. Um, it also means focusing more on the outcome that we want and not, and the problem that we want solved, not how we're actually going to solve it. Um, government policy and service challenges are complex, they're constantly changing, the environment that we work in changes and the technology that's available constantly changes. So we've got to be more flexible and more open to new approaches. Um, and use the expertise of others. Um, DFAT was criticised in the capability review that I think most of us underwent um, that said we didn't look outside of ourselves in order to, to do things and that's one of the things that we really want to help change the culture is to actually say let's talk to someone else, let's bring someone else into this process. Um, the other thing we want to drive is making information available. Um, the one thing I learnt from Google is information was the key to innovation. So the more information that you make available about a problem the more people can pull together the different pieces of that and actually come up with a solution. Um, and that also reduces the courage you need to step into the unknown. There's other sol suggesting solutions um, and there's more information available about things. Um, so what does that mean we need to do differently within the innovation exchange? Um, it means, means we need to not assume that we actually have the access to anything or everything. Um, it means we need to be more, much more open with information and make sure we share lessons learned. Uh, needs we need to be prepared to work collaboratively and by that I don't mean just consulting with people um, and work outside of our organisation and it means we need to ensure our procurement processes, our contract templates, our governance process are not hampering the ability to do something new or try something new. 
Um, an example of that, I guess, where, where true courage uh, on our behalf and on the behalf of others was really needed was when we went out to tender recently for what we call Seed Pacific. And this was an initiative to engage the private sector in, in bringing innovation into the Pacific and partnering with the private sector in what we call shared value. So how do you use what the private sector does really well to have a development impact? And we went to our procurement area who love rules and templates. And we said to them, we want to go out to market for a $20 million procurement but we don't really want to tell them what they have to do. We just want to tell them what the outcome that we want is, and we want them to work with us and co-create a solution to that. Um, now, that was really scary for our procurement area because they had no way of measuring one person's approaches to another person's approach because there was no strict, um, I guess, exact dictation of exactly what we required. We also said, wanted, said to the procurement area, and we don't want to dictate exactly how much per day or per hour we want to pay these people. We want them to tell us what the best payment approach will be, and we want to pay them based on their results. Um, so after lots and lots of negotiation, we got there, but that took a lot of courage for the department to take that risk. Um, and what we predicted came true was that the type of organisations that responded to that tender were organisations that we had never worked with before, and that was exactly what we wanted, because we wanted to bring new and fresh thinking. Um, we didn't want a standard managing contract or arrangement that we'd already done a million times before. So why innovate in, in DFAT? I mean, we've got a pretty good role. Um, we, we've got a pretty solid way of responding to consular approaches and, and foreign policy issues. Um, but the world constantly changes, and we've got to respond to that. Um, we also have so many different pockets of our work that don't talk to each other, that innovation can also be encouraged or enabled through sharing that information. Um, and we want to actually start a stronger demand for innovation and demonstrate to the staff from top-down action commitment um, through this ideas challenge that we ran. So just very quickly, and we're probably running a bit out of time, um, we wanted to test that what staff were telling us, which is that ideas were out there but there was no pathway just to get them through, that that was actually true. Um, we wanted staff to talk about what innovation was and what it meant to them in their role. Um, we wanted to test how open the DFAT executive truly were in terms of decision making, how open they were to do something, um, and to actually have a staff driven approach to decision making. And we wanted to get staff involved in what the Innovation Exchange was doing and connect with them. Um, we said to the Secretary when we started, we think we maybe get 20 or 50 ideas, we, know, we think we could deal with that, and we got 392. Um, which we weren't expecting. Um, and we also had over 16,000 votes. So staff could put up an idea, they could comment or, or help improve on that idea, or they could vote for their favourite ideas. And um, we got massive staff engagement in that. Um, we got literally thousands of comments and 16,000 votes. Um, and those votes helped to choose what the finalists were, and we presented those finalists to the Minister and the Parliamentary Secretary. Um, and so while the outcomes of the, the winning ideas, which was a cloud passport and a no-win, no-fee tax reform idea, um, what it told us was that there was huge appetite for reform. It told us that there was a good understanding of, of where we needed to improve in our business. Um, and not only did we choose two winning ideas, which the department is, is funding to actually take to a sort of a business case and a concept and hopefully a trial, but there was a further 20 or 30 ideas with the department just said, they make a lot of common sense, let's just do it. Um, and it started this process of actually people being encouraged to go, I've got a good idea too, and, and, and it's just continuing um, to grow. So um, just in summary, I guess the question is, you know, based on what we've heard from, from Matt and Mark today, can you imagine working in the private sector and not changing your products or services to adapt to new technologies or new markets or new consumer demands? Um, you just wouldn't get there, and we shouldn't be different in government. Um, people in the private sector are rewarded for innovation. Um, but the question is, are public servants? Um, probably not. Um, so we need to change that reward structure as well. Um, what we're not rewarded for is failure, um, but we need to see, see, see failure differently, and failure needs to be seen as an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to share a, a, a new knowledge um, that we didn't have before. But as long as you do it on a small scale, you know, failing on things that invested millions and millions of taxpayers' dollars in idea. So it's that it's that failing, you know, starting small um, and, and and trialing is the idea, and that minimises that courage investment that you need. To make. 
Um, you can also minimise that, that risk and that courage needed by bringing in new voices. So don't just test your approach or idea, test your assumptions, um, your knowledge sphere by bringing in other expertise into the conversation. Um, and it's not just being protective about you own this idea, um, just see it as a work in progress. Um, and get others into the room who want to own that outcome too and identify where, you, where your commonalities are. Um, so in today's world, I think, uh, in summary, you do need more courage to, um, to, to innovate, but you also need courage to maintain the status quo because I actually think that's probably more risky than actually trying to, to, to adapt and, and trying. Um, innovation is kind of a, you know, a current buzzword um, and soon we'll come up with a new one. But it really is just a, a way of making sure that you're seek, the thinking frequently about what is the best way that I can go about achieving this outcome um, and being flexible and adjusting as you go. So that's it. Thank you very much, Lisa, and belatedly to Matt and Martin as well. Um, <laughs> Martin, the department's yep. recently been for capability review as well, and one of the... Um, findings from the review team was that we had demonstrated some examples of innovative practice, uh, but we hadn't shown how we would continue to do that and in a systematic way. So I was just interested in whether you had any views about how you can encourage innovation within a firm or within an agency. Yeah, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Because um, you're, you're trying to kind of embed this notion that um, that process of change is going to become permanent. Um, I mean, I, th I think you, the way you do it, th there are two things that quickly come to mind. The first is this, going back to the point I made earlier about leaders holding space, you have to create a leadership uh, capability where people understand that their job, at least in part, is to create and then hold space for other people to, f to fill um, that space with innovation. So that's, that's kind of one obvious point, um, I guess. And the other is that I think the use of labs... Um, exchanges, the sort of thing that Lisa's just been talking about, strike me as being a useful way of creating a kind of structural sign that the innovation um, um, ethic is alive and well, that people can see that it's something that's worth, that, that the organisation thinks is worth actually investing in. But generally speaking, you know, the only, the only simple rule of this game is that organisations, people in organisations listen to what the organisation does, not what it says. So if the organisation isn't consistently actually acting in ways which reward and um, make it clear that people who are trying something different get on and survive and succeed in the organisation, then it won't matter how many labs you set up or how many programmes you set up or how many speeches you give, people will listen to the way the organisation actually behaves. Thanks, Martin. Now I'll open it up to the floor. Back in about uh, the, the early to mid-1980s, some of us are old enough to remember that time, there was a Labour Party politician by the name of Barry Jones. And Barry wrote yes. a book called Sleepers Awake. And the main theme of that book basically was that Australia needed to get off the riding on the sheep's back and exporting... Uh, having an economy that was fundamentally driven by, by agriculture and mining. Uh, he used examples like saying we would export five cents worth of iron ore and spend $300 back buying the wristwatch that it was made from in Japan. Um, and a, an economy can't run on that basis. Um, so here we are 30 years after... And Barry could probably have written the same book, although he basically said in those days it was about how we needed to move to the service industries and now it's how we need to, you know, move to different sorts of industries. Um, and I guess to give another example, which uh, 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 is, is closer to, to my own family, the... the the one area you'd think Australia should be able to do reasonably well in is globally connected industries like computer games. And only earlier this year, the last major studio in Canberra that made computer games shut down because it couldn't sustain an industry in this town. So I guess the question is, where did we go wrong? What can we do differently? And how do we avoid being in this position again? in 30 years' time. 
Matt, I see you're desperate to well, take up the challenge on that. Well, that's kind of where you started off, wasn't it? That's part of the problem, isn't it? Well, I mean, I, I think in the last 30 years, all the things we've done have really gone backwards. I mean, we've had declining enrolments in university courses in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. We've gone backwards in the K-12 curriculum in terms of teaching technology, mathematics, science and engineering. The school kids still think that engineering has something to do with driving trains. Uh, I did a did a, uh, a, a careers day only last year, and the same thing I thought when I did my careers day in 1990. The kids still think, you know, every kid wants to go out there and work in the tech in technology industry, they just don't understand how to get there or how, how it works. They'd love to be the next Mark Zuckerberg or the next Jack Dorsey or the next Mike Cannon Brooks, but they just don't understand the career paths, right? And you know, I, I university lecturers, God bless them, they're the same university lecturers that I had when I went through uh, engineering. Um, they've never had a job for the most part, at least in the engineering and computer science um, schools at the university I used to teach at. Um, it'd be good to kind of encourage them to go out there and work in industry and then, and then build some languages and, and come back. But uh, it, it, seems, it seems that it's very, we, we haven't created a culture of innovation or really set up the process to allow Academics to kind of go out there and take the risk of going and starting a company, and then, and then if, if, they, if they want to, potentially coming back in the future. They kind of, whenever, whenever you find an academic that's got something they want to commercialize, they're just too afraid to give up that professorship because they, once, it, once it goes, they don't think they'll be able to get it again. Um, we have a huge amount of intellectual property that's tied up in, in government institutions, the universities, the CSIRO, NICTA, and so forth. And you have this amazing mismatch. It's, just, it's kind of funny. You have all these deep intellectual properties sitting in these. In these, in these institutions and, and with, without the entrepreneurs and you have all these entrepreneurs running around town without any deep intellectual property or any ideas and you could, you know, if we could just do something simple like create a register of here's all the intellectual property that's in all the different universities and the CSIRO and the research institutions and so forth and maybe what we say is category one intellectual property, look, we don't really care so much about it, it's free, if you want to commercialise it, it'll make for a better country and a better world, that's great. Category two, there's a, there's, a, there's a set structure. If you want to go commercialise it, maybe it's a 2% royalty or whatever it is, whatever the structure is, but they, people know when they go and approach the institution what the deal is rather than enter into a 6, 9, 12, two-year protracted negotiation trying to get it out. And, 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 and the, believe me, I've tried to get universities to kind of work on research projects or what have you. It's next to impossible when you start looking at intellectual property concerns. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a cat category three, which is the stuff that we think is really special and really important. And maybe that's more expensive to kind of take and commercialise, but you know, at least you know up front kind of what, what the cost is be, what the cost will be. At the moment, it, it's all kind of hidden away. You know, I think, I think, it's, we, I think there's some really, really um, simple things we can do with some basic reform, like they've done in the United Kingdom around um, uh, uh, allowing the crowdfunding of, of, of technology companies. So in the UK, if you have a qualifying, the key here is qualifying um, a technology company, and I'm not talking any sort of company, I'm talking it's got to be a company which has the ability to um, scale very quickly, deep intellectual property, all the characteristics you want of a, of a high growth startup and not just a small business, uh, um, then um, there's just some, there's some very simple um, uh, tax incentives for you to, to invest in them, such as uh, you know, in, the, in the year that you do the investment, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, um, some taxation relief. Uh, if you hold the investment over a protracted period of time, and there's some, there's some capital gains relief, and then if you dust your money because the thing blows up, again, there's a bit of relief you get at that, at that point in time. I mean, the UK's got a fantastic model for that. Um, you know, th there's some stuff we can do around crowd financing. I talked about that, that, that earlier. I fear that the problem is that, you know, every time Australia looks to kind of implement a policy, we go look at all the world's examples, and there's some, usually some great examples from Canada or the UK or the US or wherever it is, and we kind of Implement, implement something that's just slightly worse than everything else. So, you know, in the taxation of employee share schemes. It, I mean, this is wealth redistribution from, from owners to workers, right? I can't really think of who wouldn't want, you know, you know when the next Atlassian goes IPO or, or whatever it may be, um, more equitable wealth risk distribution within high technology startups. Um, but instead, we kind of make it so companies like mine are ineligible. Companies like Atlassians are ineligible because they've been around for 10 years. Um, you know, companies that do over 50 million in turnover are ineligible, right? Uh, it's it's kind of it it's cunningly carved out the entire technology industry, which which kind of which actually employs people. So so it's lip service being done to early stage startups 
who are quite vocal around you know wanting to remunerate people with 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 options or whatever it may be because they haven't got no money to be able to afford them. But the unfortunate fact is. The companies like mine need to compete on a global playing field for talent. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how bad the playing field is right now for talent, is that because we don't produce enough graduates from university, the costs to hire people in this country are just absolutely mind, get, you know, going to mind-boggling levels. I had two staff poached from my company last year by Facebook in Silicon Valley. They were two to three years out of university, and they got paid a quarter million dollars each, right? I mean, and every year it's getting higher and higher and higher and higher. I mean, you know, it, it's, you know, graduates now from computer science are on six figures, right? And despite, I don't know where people have got in, in the general public an idea that, that, that you can't get a job in, in information technology or computer science. I mean, we are hiring people by the metric ton and that we cannot get enough. And to make it even worse, when you try and hire someone at a senior level, all the good people are gone. They've all gone to Silicon Valley. They've all left, right? So... We don't have in, in Australia the people who can be the managers and the vice presidents and so forth. I caught a recruiter two weeks ago in Silicon Valley. I told the top recruiter in Silicon Valley for hiring uh, vice presidents in, te in technical fields. And I said, listen, I've got, I've got a role kind of potentially likely to place. The conversation lasted 60 seconds. Uh, they said, look, look, we'd love to help you uh, at this role. And we know that we'd make a fee of about $300,000 in placing it. Uh, but no one wants to come to Australia to be in the technology industry. We, we, we're sorry. We, we were approached by another, I won't mention the name, but another billion dollar technology company only a few weeks ago to place a vice president role. We just turned them down. We have another company um, that, that, that has a role which is not full time in Australia. It's kind of half time in Australia, half time in the US, and no one wants to apply for it uh, because Australia is a backwater. And we used to think people would move for the social life um, and, 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 and so forth, but. You know, Sydney's got a terrible reputation now because you've locked up all the bars and clubs and so forth, so there's no nightlife anymore. So no one says it's as boring as Silicon Valley, Matt. They want to stay in Silicon Valley. And it's two moves now because it's not just one move to Australia and, and they have to kind of you know, bring everything across. They've got, they, a, it's classified now as two moves because they've got to go back to Silicon Valley and get re back, re back into the, in, in the industry. And absolutely no one wants to do it. So the guy, I couldn't believe it. I wanted to pay him $300,000 in, in terms of a fee. I didn't want to pay him the fee, but, <laughs> but yeah, that was, that, that was the cost. And he said, I always want to take the role. And I've turned down these other guys, and, and we, we just won't take roles for Australia. So, I mean, it's a really, really tough environment you have here that, that in, in terms of hiring staff, it, I mean, it's the, it's the second most expensive city in Sydney globally for doing a startup. You know, rents are expensive. Rent is just ridiculous. Um, you know, wages are spiring out of control, we, and we don't have people into the industry. I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of things, bunch of things we can do, which I think are fairly simple to solve the problem that that no, won't necessarily even cost a lot of money. But you know, we need things like innovation in the K to 12 curriculum, and that's not going to happen unless someone comes along and bangs a few heads together. So the only Thanks, thing Matt. I, I think that's um, uh, old man, if you've got something you'd like to add. Well, no, just, the only quick comment I was going to make is if you think about when Barry Jones wrote his book, he wrote his book just on the cusp of a period when it, it appeared as if Australia didn't have to take the advice that he was offering because actually there was another way forward and we've done quite well under that for 25 years. That does appear to me to absolutely have run out and I've got a feeling that the world is turning to the point where some of the things that Matt's just talked about have reached the point where people are saying, you know what, we've got to deal with this shit, otherwise we are just not going to make it. So maybe if Barry wrote his book now, as opposed to 1980, maybe we get us... Well, we'll see. We will see. Because I just have a sense that the kind of litany of, you know, kind of sad... Um, those sad um, situations, but also the way you can actually fix that, I think is beginning to get to the point where people are ready to do something about it. But anyway, we'll see in the next five years. Um, I've got a question for Lisa. I just, you talked a lot about getting staff on board and getting them to change how they do things and look at things. What was the biggest challenge to get them to do that? Um, the biggest challenge was probably that, that you know when the minister set us up, um, you know we were only six people at the time. Um, and so how, how does six people influence 5,000? Um, at, at, at a time where the minister was, was absolutely a champion of what we did, what we did, but she was probably the only one. Um, so, you know, we had to sort of work first on um, what is the DFAT culture and how do we work within that? So the DFAT culture is if there's a rule, I'll comply with it. 
and if there's something where it's a competitive culture, so if there's something where I can stand out above the next guy, I'll do it so that I'm better positioned for the next posting opportunity that comes around. So we had to work within that. So, you know, the idea was that we, we talked the secretary through, now how do we give staff maximum recognition for contributing to this process of having a winning idea. Um, and so it became a bit more, we, we fed into, if you like, the competitive nature of the department. Um, and that's why we made it a competition. There was a winner who'd get to spend time with the minister. Um, and you know, there was a reward for that. You, they got to have six months out of their current role to actually help them develop and implement their role, their, that idea. Um, so it had to be very much around that reward and recognition um, in order for it to work. Um, and we communicated over and over and over and over and over again. Um, we really just drowned people in, in information and encouragement and messages from the, from the secretary. And you know, we didn't do things in the standard way. So we didn't get the secretary to put out an admin circular on the internet and hope that people read it. We put a video out. So the secretary was in a video, um, which was unusual for him. And we played it in the breakout areas. We played it in the cafeteria. And we just constantly reiterated the same message. This was happening and it was on. Um, you know, so it was just through communication and awareness. And I think once, once you know, some people get on board, it, then it, then the competitive juices happen. Oh yes, um, thank you very much for some uh, thought-provoking talks. One thing that occurred to me, and it was sparked by um, perhaps a comment that Martin you made, but also uh, Lisa, some of your observations about setting up the innovation exchange, and that's about the difference between innovation and incrementalism. Um, and I've wondered in a bureaucratic context whether often, um, well, many innovations start out being incremental. I mean, in one sense, you could say that Uber or Airbnb are you know, an incremental advancement on the kind of marketplace you had with, say, eBay and some of those earlier things that were done a little earlier. Um, but in a bureaucratic context, sometimes just being constantly mindful of seeing whether there's a way to make something just a little bit better can end up with something which is quite, appears quite different from the outside and which might not appear incremental, that it can be safer for staff to, to look at whether they can do something just a little bit better and different and be encouraged to do that. Um, I wonder whether you, Lisa and perhaps Martin, have any comments on um, whether um, encouraging incrementalism is a good way to lead to uh, larger changes in the longer run. Um, Martin, I can start if you like. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, look... I don't think you'd want to. St I don't think you want to box. You know, this is innovation, and that's and that's not, um, because you just stifle ideas and you, and you stifle that that sort of creative um, process. So I think in anywhere where people can see an opportunity for improvement, that should be encouraged in some way. Um, we when we did our ideas challenge, when I say I got 392 ideas, none of them were you know mind blowing, amazingly innovative ideas. Most of them were what we classed as modernisation ideas. They were about improving the way that we did this, did what we did. So exactly as you described, they're about building on an existing service and making it better or faster or cheaper or, or you know, using better technology or, or whatever the case may be. So we absolutely didn't want to stifle that because that's still, you know, it's still defect getting out of its current comfort zone, um, and we certainly wanted to encourage that. And like you said, you don't know where something's going to go. So, you know, one of the ideas that we come across was mixing the information that we put at the moment through on a smart traveller. So for those of you who travel overseas, you should just fill in your smart traveller. Um, and blending that with Facebook, because we found when disasters happen, the information actually doesn't come through those official websites. The information gets out through Facebook now. Um, and that's how people find out that where people are, you know, whether they're safe or not, where the disasters hit and who's affected is happening now through Facebook. So, we, you know, one of the ideas was how do we bring those two platforms together? Um, so, you know, that's an incremental idea, but it could be actually quite transformational in the way that we get information out to people and the way that we receive information in a disaster situation. So, yeah. The interesting quick observation I'd make, it's really interesting, isn't it, to think about, um, I mean, all of the examples that Matt's used, but we've, you know, so we've talked about Facebook and Uber and Airbnb, and it's true at one level they didn't start out by saying, oh, I know, let's disrupt the, um, you know, the hotel business. What they started out with was we got this cool idea about how we could use you know, people's lounges and sofas because you know, it was a problem for us and we'll just sort of fix it. The question about how transformational it becomes is actually in the end a decision that's not taken by you. It's taken by what goes on outside of your organisation. So the decision and the scale and the speed at which that happens is actually set by other people, which is an interesting observation. Incrementalism, it seems to me, is fine, so long as you know that at one point, 
constantly trying to make an old system better gets to the point where it's actually time for something new. And it's always a judgment as to when that is. I understand all that. You know, how, how long do you go on fiddling with the horse and buggy before you realise that actually what you need to car? Um, my only observation would make it's not going to be up to you. You just got to be very, very careful and think about what the world is telling you about what it wants. And Airbnb and Uber have taken off, not in the end, because those guys or girls or whoever they were had a view that said, we are now going to completely um, disrupt everything. It took off because it worked. And then the demand from outside said, this is the pace and the rate at which we want to go. So get on board or get out of the way. Well, my, my company, I mean, you can't have so 400, freelance. You can't have 420 people just going for moonshots because you won't, you won't get anywhere, right? So, I mean, the, yeah. and, and, and the way I would run the company is actually kind of different from kind of how you... You hear the general advice out there, you know, focus on the long term, don't focus on the short term, you know, focus on building a big long term company. I mean, you can't build a company like that. From my perspective, I just get everyone to focus on the short term because I, I can't tell you in three years from now what the revenue of the company will be. I don't have a clue, right? But I can tell you what it will be next month because I've got these guys working on this project that will increase the conversion rate of traffic to sign ups from X to Y, we think, because we're going to make some improvements and how the page is designed or how something's structured or the timing or the speeds or whatever. So the way, the way my company has worked is you've we've had a tremendous focus on short-termism and really incremental change. So everyone, every month has got an OKR or set of OKRs, um, key, key results, objectives, that they have to achieve at the end of the month. And just month by month by month, you have to grind it out. And, it, yeah, and, and we're constantly running experiments. So we're constantly doing what we call A-B tests where you'll have two different designs, which one's better, put half the traffic over here, half the traffic over there. Probably about 30 or so they're running per day, at least. We're shipping code 20 times a day, and it is constant, yes. the constant focus so on, on, on incrementalism. And that's, that's, that's quick, the base. quick incrementalism. Because that's how you get the compound, the compound, yes. compound growth, right? Just chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. Now, you do need to have a few people thinking about the longer term and how it's all going to fit together and maybe when you have to do a step change in the, yeah. the technologies and what have you. But the vast majority of people, people at the company are focusing rigorously on incrementalism. But the only, the only other option, that's terrific. It's a very good uh, exposition about how you, as it were, innovate for the long term by ignoring the long term. I think that's kind of interesting. Um, but as an, observer, as an observer of freelancer and actually as a, as a customer, quite a satisfied customer, I have to say, it works. There's a fundamentally shape-shifting idea at the heart of freelancer. Fundamentally. The fact that you do it week by week, day by day, A-B test by A-B test, I, frankly for me, is, that's great. That's the way you make your money and make your success. But there's something profoundly revolutionary about what you're doing. And you knew that when you started, I would suggest. And certainly the Airbnb guys, I think, did. How they make that happen, they don't. Yeah, you're right. They don't say, well, well let's do a five-year business plan. I understand that. But there is something fundamentally... Yeah, it, it's, fun, it's, 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 it's funny yes, you no. say you knew that when I start, when you started, because let me tell you, back in, in 2007 when I stumbled across the concept, so I didn't invent the concept, no, no, I that's fair enough. used a small site and I loved it and I bought it and that's it. whatever, I wasn't think. I, I did kind of think to myself, you know, you have global marketplaces of products out there of the size and scale of eBay and Amazon and Alibaba, and I kind of thought, well, surely you'll have a global, mar global marketplace of services of that sort of size and scale, but I wasn't really quite thinking how that would look. I just thought, gee, this is a, this should be a very, very big category that's kind of been overlooked for whatever right. reason. Or, you know, why hasn't eBay done it, for example, yeah. right? But when I looked at the business and I thought, well, it's doing a million a year in revenue. I'm pretty sure I can get it to five or ten, right? right? And then just chip away, chip away, chip away. And then you get to five million in revenue and you go, well, I'm pretty sure I can get it to 20. Mm. And chip away, chip away, chip away. And let me tell you, I, if, you if you have that rigorous perseverance for just, the, you know, it, it, I really do have the short termism of there's three things we focus on. There's revenue, revenue, and revenue. <laughs> and you chip away at it. Let me tell you, eventually you get there. You know, the twenty becomes fifty and the fifty becomes a hundred, and then eventually you're starting to make real money. And the good thing is that every time you can make that little bit more in revenue each month, mm -hmm. you can hire a whole new team to go go and fix up all the other problems. Yes. Right? Yes. So we're constantly it's a state state of organized chaos, right? Where you're kinda of like you're you're running ahead and you're just trying to get extra revenue. Because the revenue pays for another team of 20 people that puts the next come in behind yeah, you exactly. and trying to fix up all the bugs and all the problems, all the puts your next three steps in. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And then they have a team behind them, and then they have that's a team good. behind them, and you're well, constantly racing. So. That's a masterclass. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do much better than that. I could not have said it better than that. In fact, I'm making notes. <laughs>
Uh, thanks very much for those insights, Matt. I think that's quite extraordinary. Uh, unfortunately, um, we've, uh, we've gone over time for today's presentation, uh, but I think we have been blessed by three very excellent presentations that have both raised some issues but also talked about some of the solutions. And I think for us as policy practitioners, that's very useful information and very useful guidance for our thinking uh, within the department and within our area of influence as well. So I'd like to thank our three speakers uh, for their excellent contribution today.